Hey you folks, Quilly Teen here and welcome to Let's Try Charterstone, the digital edition of one of the most truly wonderful and beautiful board games I have ever played. Now normally I would give you a little bit of an introduction to the core concept of this game here, but I think the best thing to do is actually to jump right in. This is, oh, this is fantastic. Um, there's online mode, which I have played. I've played a couple of games with Essentia, uh, A Kiss for Luck, and Rhinoceros Maximus. We had a lovely time with that. You can play the campaign or the single game. We're going to go into the campaign because it's going to sort of explain some of the context a little bit more. I'm going to choose an empty slot here. I'm just going to ask us to name the village. I'm going to call this, I don't know, Let's Playton? Nah, uh, Quillshire. Oh, I like that a lot. Quillshire, excellent. So in the uh, real life physical version of the board game, you'd be writing this on the board with a Sharpie. Wait, what? Yes, Charterstone is one of these legacy games. One of these games where as you play the game, you will be making permanent changes to the game itself. It starts off incredibly simple. Game one, you might be like, oh, this is, this is maybe too straightforward. I don't know, except as you play, you will be as you'll find out the story here is we're developing a town, you will be building more buildings, which gives you tons more options about what you're going to do in each and every turn. You're going to be unlocking new rules, which dramatically change gameplay. And you are going to be making many decisions that permanently alter the board. The campaign itself is played out over a series of 12 games. At the end of 12 games, you are left with a perfectly playable worker placement game that you can play infinitely. Or, if you decide that you enjoyed the campaign building thing so much, you can flip the board over to the other side, where an exact copy of the original start is there, blank and ready for you to go, and you just order another box of the stickers, which is effectively what you use to develop the board. Legacy games do <laughs> blow people's mind a little bit. Like, oh my god, I don't know if I can deal with this properly. Um, but they are some of the most exquisite experiences that you can get. I think the first game that really came out with the Legacy version that, that sort of started all this was Pandemic Legacy, but Charterstone I absolutely adore. Now, if, if making permanent changes to a physical board is still too messed up for you, hey, we've got this digital version now. Let's go ahead and do it. Um, at the start, you're going to choose from one of the six charters. So basically, as it's going to be explained in a moment, in this village, we all have our sort of own personal slice of the village, our own personal charter that we will be working to develop. Um, each one of these has a slightly different flavor. So which one you choose will slightly impact the... I, more maybe the tone of your experience than anything else, because as you'll see once we start playing, you can use all the buildings in anyone's charter at any time with no advantages or penalties whatsoever. Um, so um, you're not going to be locked into anything specific regardless of who you choose over here. But as a general feel, uh, the yellow charter over here is going to grow grain and have like kind of bakeries and, and chefs and things like that. The blue charter is going to start with metal production. Um, and it's going to have maybe a slightly more industrial kind of vibe to it. The red charter has a clay pit. The green charter is going to start off in the forest and have some lumber stuff, but also be responsible for some of the economic stuff. We can actually get a little flavor over here. And I'm going to be playing as the green charter because that's the one I played with when I played the physical version of the board game. The gray charter over here starts with coal mining, and the purple charter has a little pumpkin patch. And spoiler alert, later on, you get to have cats. Okay, maybe the purple charter is the best just because of the cats. That is entirely possible. Maybe I should just play as the purple charter. You want, let's play as the purple charter because we can get some kitties. Um, again, break out your Sharpie because you're going to be naming your character. I'll just name myself Quill. That seems okay. And we'll go ahead and get started. Um, you can play this game with up to six players. There are six charters. And, you know... If you can have six actual players, that may in fact be your best and most enjoyable experience. You know, if you can get six people in real life. Um, single player, you can play with bots. The thing is, you can leave some of the charters empty, and that's okay. The game is configured to support that. Um, and what I'll do is I'll play with four players, which is actually the default when you start a new game here. And I think it'll be a good way to, uh, to give some examples. So our opponents, we're going to have Bruce, Christelle, and Sebastian. So Bruce is going to be the yellow charter. Christelle is going to be the gray charter. Sebastian's going to have the red one, which means that the green and blue charters are going to be empty or not controlled by any player. But again, they're still, they have certain rules for their own development. We're going to go ahead and start the game and we'll see what it's like. Um, the physical version of this game is absolutely lovely to look at. And the digital version is just as nice, if not even cuter. There's also excellent music here, but I'm not sure about the status of its, you know, licensing and copywriting and stuff like that uh, could always lead to flags on YouTube. So I went and muted the music, which does make me a little bit sad because it is very lovely. Here's the backstory. 
The immortal Forever King has selected four citizens of Green Gully to start a new village far from the Eternal City. Congratulations for being chosen! Your goal is to bring the greatest glory to the Forever King so that you may rule the village in his name. After spending all day flying over the kingdom, the Zeppelin sets down and the guards open the hatch for you and your companions. The sun is setting as you venture outside. The location is a lush landscape of rolling hills, patches of trees, and a babbling brook. The guards unload a number of mysterious crates and forbid you to open any of them. The group gathers around a large rock. You recognize it as the Charter Stone, or, you know, a die with funny faces, uh, just like the one at the center of the Eternal City. Your first task! Quill, your first task is to construct a basic resource building in your charter. It will provide you with the basic resource of your charter. You can construct it when your six plots available in your charter. This time, the construction is free. In the future, however, it will cost you valuable resources. What's more, as a reward for constructing buildings, you will usually be rewarded with a crate. I wonder what could be inside. So indeed, this is my purple charter over here. Each of the charters has six slots. Um, and the way it works in the physical version is you have a card with a sticker that you peel off and actually physically place here. Don't place it crooked or you'll have ruined everything forever. So sometimes some of these permanent choices have a little bit of that stress that way because, oh my God, what if I make the board ugly? You know what? Make a story about it, it's fine. But again, in the digital version, we don't have to worry about that. So I may be placing my first building. All of the other players will do the same. The green charter and the uh, blue charter, who uh, do not have a player in this campaign, have already placed theirs. Doesn't matter where we put it. I'll, um, I don't know, I'll put it down in the bottom left corner. That seems fine. So there's our little pumpkin farm. And then you get to name your charter. Um, uh, um, Paradise Pumpkins? Hmm... You know, I should call myself Gordon, because I'm growing gourds. Um, it's like pumpkins and cats. Pump kitties, pump kitties, pump kitty farms. It sounds weird and dirty. I don't know. We're just going to be the pumpkin patch. Done and done. The pumpkin patch over here. I like it. So that's us. Everything's ready. Ready to play. And we'll just figure out who goes first by rolling the die. It is going to be yellow. Uh, so Bruce is going to be first, and I will be last, unfortunately. Well, that's annoying. But hey, at least we get to see what everyone else is going to do. So on your turn, it's very simple. The only thing you can do in this game is take one of your workers and place it on one of the buildings. That's it. Everyone's got two workers. You take your action by taking your worker and place it on the building. So if I select one, it'll highlight all the buildings where I can currently... Uh, play because you know I meet the various cost requirements the basic buildings of which each charter has one are very simple So if I play on the pumpkin patch, I get a pumpkin clay pit. I will get a clay brick. I will get metal I will get coal. I will get grain. I will get wood So those basic buildings over here and then some of the others are a little bit more complex For example at the charter stone if I play here it has a cost it costs me two influence uh, Where's the tooltip? I might be in the wrong mode for the tooltip to show up. Let me uh, just back up here there it is. So if I play on the Charter Stone, it requires that I pay two influence. I start with 12. That's over here, 12 influence. It also requires that I pay four coins. I've got exactly four coins. And it requires that I have a crate card. Well, if I look in my hand, I do, in fact, have a crate card. In fact, each one of us starts with one. The crate was a reward for placing our very first building. And this crate will unlock stuff. In the way the physical uh, board game works is, let's say I open this crate. So I have crate number one. We have a big box, and there's a chart on it. It says, okay, if you open crate number one, pull out cards 3, 4, 17, and 52, and then give it to the player. There's like, I don't know, 300 cards or something like that. that that's, how, that's how it works. It's nuts. Um, physically, the way it works is this card actually was the card for my... Um, what is it actually called? Is it called a pumpkin patch, pumpkin farm? It's just called garden. There we go. So I have my card called garden. I removed the sticker and put the sticker on the board. And what's left of the card, that is my crate card. That's how it works uh, sort of physically in there. Um, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just crack open my crate right away, which seems fine. So I'm going to grab one of my workers. I'm going to play on the charter stone over here. It will. I will pay two influence, four coins, choose which crate to open. Well, I only have the one in my hand. I mean, it's literally number one as well. So I guess I'm going to open this one. And hey, I've opened the first crate. I also, from opening the crate, I just got five victory points. I also advanced the progress, which we'll talk about in a second. We're going to go ahead and open this up. I'm going to get four cards, one of which, though, is a new rule. So um, it just so happens the first card that everyone is going to open is going to have exactly two buildings and one persona in it. 
And the first person who opens a card also reveals the rules that govern the persona. We'll look at that. So my new cards are going to be two buildings. I have a greenhouse. To build the greenhouse, I will need two pumpkins, one wood, and one grain. Once I have built the greenhouse, I will be putting this sticker on the board, and this is going to be a new building that anyone can place a worker on to use. To use this building, you will have to pay one influence. It gives you one pumpkin. So my garden, you play here, it gives you a pumpkin. The greenhouse costs an influence, gives you a pumpkin, but also gives you a victory point. Spoiler alert, the way to win the game is to come out with the most victory points at the end. Hey, neat. My second building is a pumpkin market. So this will cost me two pumpkins, one coal, and one steel to build. To use this card, you put your worker here, you have to pay a pumpkin, but you get a coin and a victory point. Ooh. Here are the rules on personas. I'm going to skip over it. We'll show you what a persona looks like. Here's the gardener persona. The persona currently will just go in my box. Each player has a, has a little personal box where they get to keep their certain stuff from game to game. Again, it's a 12-game campaign. Certain things will carry over from game to game to game, including all the personas you have unlocked. At the start of a game, you will choose one of the personas in your box to play as for this particular game. So this gardener, I'm not going to get to use right away. But in game two, I could pick him. And then with the gardener in play, whenever I use a building with a pumpkin cost, gain a victory point. Well, I just actually unlocked a building with a pumpkin cost, the pumpkin market. So if I were to build the pumpkin market, and next game, have the gardener, every time I use the pumpkin market, I would get a coin and two victory points. Hey, I had a little combo already. Nice. Again, game one, even game two, they're going to be very simple. But there starts to be a lot of crazy interactions. Anyway, that's my turn. I went to the Charter Stone. I'm done. I'm going to do that. Everyone else is going to get an action. Now, yellow just used the Charter Stone. Most worker placement games, the way it works is when someone has placed a worker on a building or a slot or whatever it is in that game, no one else can use it until the round is over. And then at the end of the round, everyone picks up their workers and everything is clear again. Charterstone doesn't have rounds. It's just continuous play from the start until you finish the game. What happens is if you put a worker on a building that someone else is a worker, you just bump their worker back to their hand. And this is a good thing for that person because there's, there's no benefit to having a worker on a building. When you place your worker, you get a thing. After that, there's nothing. So you really want, the pro move is to place your workers where you think other people are likely to play after you so that your worker gets bumped back to your hand. Because at the start of your turn, if you have no workers in your hand, your whole action is just, I pick up all my workers. And you want to minimize that because that's sort of a dead turn. Very boring. So the smart thing is figure out where other people might play. Play there first, and it's really nice. Anyway, uh, I think his name is Bruce here. Bruce has unlocked a granary, which uh, is a building where you can spend an influence to get a grain and a coin. He's also got a grain market where you can spend a grain to get a coin and a boat. Now, these are fairly similar to the two cards I have just unlocked but they're not the same. Again, the first two buildings are, are going to seem very familiar, and then they're going to go pretty different. But it's already different. The grain market, so for me, my pumpkin market is I trade in a pumpkin for a coin and a victory point. Here, it's a coin and a reputation. What's a reputation? Well, we'll find out in a second. And then he's got his persona that he'll be able to use in the future. I suspect a lot of people are going to go to the Charter Stone now. There we go. So, getting more cards. Boo, 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 boo. And so, I don't remember your name, I'm very sorry. You've got the Hoist House, so pay uh, an influence to get a coal and a coin. Pay a coal to get two coins. Again, similar, but different. Coal market's a great way to make a huge amount of money. And again, anyone can use anyone else's buildings once they are built. And then the minor persona, we'll see a Sebastian over here. Are you going to go to the Charter Stone? You are. So you're going to pop open some more cards too. See, everyone thinks what I did was cool, so they're just copying me. But again, this is really great because both my workers are back in my hand here. Um, the brick market, okay. So spend, send a, a brick for a coin and a victory point, similar to my pumpkin one. And here, spend an influence to get two bricks. And then his persona as the mason. All right, and now it's back to me. If we look here, you can see Sebastian has no more workers in his hand because his workers are on the board here and here. If by the time Sebastian's turn comes around again, no one has played on the charter stone or the clay pit, He's going to have to spend his whole turn just picking up his little peons. Now, no one has got the resources to spend on the Charter Stone again, so that one's kind of stuck there. So the question is, is anyone going to look for a brick to bounce it, or is he going to have to take basically a dead turn? Now, on our turn, let's take a look at our hand. So if I click over here, these are all the advancement cards in my hand. Advancement cards are potential buildings. They are crates. There are also other types of advancement cards. 
Here is the advancement map. These are cards that we can purchase. There are, at the start of the game, we have access to assistance. So for example, um, I like the innovator. Let's talk about the innovator over here. So the innovator is an assistant. If you acquire this advancement, so if this advancement card is in your hand, the innovator, by the way, if you acquire the innovator, you get to name her. You get to name all these people the first time you get them. Again, break out your Sharpie. I love this game. It's so great. Um, so if the innovator is in your hand, whenever you use Charter Stone Building, you know that building we just used here to open crates? Well, if you have the innovator, whenever you use Charter Stone Building, gain two victory points. Ooh! So a lot, all these, um, these assistants have some sort of passive ability like that. Hey, Engineer, whenever you use Zeppelin, the Zeppelin, by the way, is how you build buildings. Basically, you, you spend the money at the Zeppelin, and the Zeppelin comes and airdrops the new building. If you have the Engineer, whenever you build a building, I use the Zeppelin, you get two victory points. Ooh, that's kind of cool. Now, you can see here there's also a crate in here. This crate would normally belong to the blue player over here with the blue charter, except they're not in the game. But... Their cards, their crates, which would unlock more stuff in the future, went into the advancement map, Matt. So those cards will still be available. We will be a little tighter because there's not going to be as many places to play. On the other hand, there's not as many people playing, so it kind of makes sense. Um, so nothing is lost if you play with fewer players. The only thing the game says is try to play with the same number of players every game. Otherwise, it can get a little, a little weird. So, you know, if you start with four, finish it with four, that kind of thing. Um, how do you get advancement cards? Well... That's what these buildings in the middle are, right? So in addition to the, bu the, the buildings people build in our charters, we have the commons here. We've looked at the charter stone, which allows you to open your crates. We talked about the zeppelin, which allows you to build your buildings. We'll talk about the grandstand in a second. It has to do with objectives. We've also got the treasury over here, which allows you to exchange one of any resource in exchange for a coin. And then finally, there's the market. I like to talk about it's like a Dalek, but with like a lot of extra eye stocks over here. The market allows you to spend one of any resource plus one coin, and it lets you get an advancement card. So we have an interesting decision. Right now, what do I want to do? I could start working towards building one of my buildings. So I need two pumpkins and either a wood and a grain or a coal and a, um, uh, a steel bar it would let me build the greenhouse or the pumpkin. Or what I could do is I could maybe look at acquiring enough resources to pick up the engineer and then build my buildings, and um, and then I would get victory bonus victory points when I build it. It's worth noting, you get five victory points whenever you open a crate, whenever you build a building, and also whenever you use the grandstand. Those three buildings also advance the progress track. That's what this sort of flaming bowl is. The progress track is here. When the progress track reaches the end, that is the end of the game. Now, it um, we started, I think, with four players. We started with 17 spots. We started over here. If there's more players, you start further. You know, it's a longer game. Um, the first few advanced very quickly here because all of us started the game. All four of us started the game with the means to open a box. What's in the box? And this advanced the, uh, the progress track. Um, so it went really quick, and then people are probably going to accumulate resources to build a building, and that's going to hit it again. Um, but then it'll sort of stall out a little bit. Um, so the, the pace is sometimes a little hard to read, but it is interesting, and everyone can see when the game will end. It's worth noting, in addition to these three spots that advance the progress track, if at any point someone has no influence tokens left, um, then at the start of their turn, if you have zero influence, it also advances the progress track. So once someone goes to zero influence, the game will end fairly quickly. I should also note at this point, at the end of the game, any resources you have in your hand, so any you know bricks, pumpkins, etc., any coins, as well as any advancement cards in your hand, you will get to keep for game two. Now, that is not always exactly going to be the case. There are going to be some special rules related to capacity that are going to be introduced in game two. But... What for game one, anything you still have, you get to carry over. It's worth noting your influence, you will reset to 12 influence next game. So the influence will reset, but everything else will sort of carry over where it is, which is kind of nifty. Um, we should talk now about the reputation as well. I didn't want to front load too much information, but it's slightly relevant. Um, the reputation track over here, basically your influence markers, sometimes you will be allowed to take one of your influence markers and put it on your reputation track. At the end of the game, the person with the most reputation will gain 10 bonus victory points. Second place will get seven. I think third place gets three. 
might be three or four, I don't remember. And then after that, it is zero. Um, ties are generous, so if two people are tied for the most, they will both get ten. But jockeying for position over here is really interesting. Um, why does yellow have a point on the reputation track? Well, as you advance the progression track, sometimes you will see a reputation marker. These boats, I don't know why they're boats, but they just are. Um, if you advance the progress track, and it advances to a, a spot with one of these symbols, you will have the option of earning reputation. There will be other ways to earn reputation as people develop their buildings. In fact, uh, oh right, no one's playing green. Oh, no, here, Bruce has got one. So the grain market over here, if you sell a grain, you get a coin and have the ability to put a token on your reputation track, for example. So you can sort of compete for the win over there. <sighs> All right, let's, let's try to do the advancement thing. Let's see if we can pick up the engineer and then go and build some buildings. That would be quite cool. So we will need one coin and one resource of any type to be able to do stuff. What I'm gonna do, I guess it doesn't matter because I'm gonna end up selling over there. What I'm gonna do, hold on. What I'm gonna do is actually, I'm gonna accumulate the resources to build a building. What I kind of hope is I know that um, the uh, Christelle over here has the coal market. And if she builds that, I will have a really good way to gain money quite quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to accumulate some resources right now. I'm going to start by playing on my pumpkin patch. Both of my buildings need two pumpkins each. Theoretically, ultimately, I'm going to need four pumpkins to build all those. So I'm going to go and build on the pumpkin patch. That will be my turn. I will end my turn. Everyone else is going to take some actions. There you go. He's getting some more grain. Good for him. She's going to get more coal. Good for her. Okay, it's back to me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play on the pumpkin patch, which will bump my previous worker back to my hand. So I can keep playing on the same spot, constantly bumping my own worker back to my hand, which is kind of nice. We'll talk about the cloud port later on, but the cloud port, basically what it allows you to do is um, you are spending influence and cashing something in for some more victory points at the end of the game. Um, I'm going to keep going with my strategy, though. I'm going to play on the pumpkin patch again, bump myself. I'm now up to three pumpkins. Great. I'm going to do that until I have at least four. Um, and then I'll probably start collecting some other resources somewhere else. Uh, so that I have three. Yeah, let's do that. Done. I'm going to collect at least one coal because I might want to sell my coal for money. The other thing I could do is I could go and just go to the treasury, which would let me trade one of anything for a coin. But I'm really hoping that Christelle, yeah, she's nowhere near doing it. I'm really hoping she would put her a coal market so I could sell one coal for two coins instead of a resource for a coin. Um, I need coal for one of my buildings, right? Yeah, the pumpkin market needs a coal. So uh, regardless, I will play here because I'll want the coal for something. So I'll do that. Now, I currently have no more workers. Mo both my workers are on the board. Hopefully, someone bumps me from one of these two spots. I don't know if they will. By the way, I have no idea if I'm playing optimally or not. I'm just, But I'm going with a plan of some type. Uh, no one bumped me, so I'm going to have a null turn. I just pick up all my workers. Womp, womp. <laughs> oh, she's buying an advancement. Which advancement did you buy? Did you, did you steal my engineer? Oh, no, you bought one of the crates. Ah, very interesting. Okay. Um, hmm. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna get the. Um, I'm gonna get the steel. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna get a second steel here, and I can sell one. I'm doing that because I, I know I can bump myself. Sure. Now you're going for coal. Now that you're not bumping me. Yeah, I think I still want to buy the engineer. So what I'm going to do... Oh, I still have to sell. I need a coin. Right. Um, yeah. So I'll just come here. I'm going to sell one of my steels for a coin. Come on. Oh, yeah, you got bumped. Nice. You're just grabbing more coal for yourself. Uh-huh. So now I'm going to come here. I'm gonna spend. Um, I'm gonna spend my other steel, and I'm gonna pick up the engineer. Excellent. So he's gonna be in my hand. Oh, 
Oh, and I got bumped off the market. Oh, that's very nice. So, I mean, my worker's been stuck here for a little while, but my other guy's been, uh, been getting a lot of bonus plays. That's really, really handy. Okay. So, first of all, it's very important. I'm going to go and rename this engineer. Um, how about uh, Eric the Engineer? Eric. I don't know. It's, it starts with an E. It starts with an E. But, you know, it's important for flavor. you got to rename people. Um, you know what? Enrico. I like it better. Enrico. A little bit more flavor. Plus, then it's got the E-N for extra symmetry. That's not the right word, but, you know, something. Um, right. So, now when I use the Zeppelin, I will get more points. You can actually see it's updated here. It says seven victory points if I were to use that. So, you get a little visual indicator about the situation. Um, well, tell you what. If I got a steel, I would be able to build a building, and I have a worker here, so it's very convenient. I can go here, bump myself, get the steel, and have a worker back. And so my plan is probably to Zeppelin next turn. Um, unless, unless I want to just pick up some resources potentially for something else. So here's the question. Is anyone close to doing a Zeppelin action? Not yet. Sebastian's pretty close, but that's it. So, okay, let's take a look at Sebastian. Oops. Sebastian is very close to building the kiln, which needs an extra coal. So that's very likely where he's going to go. The thing is, I don't need an extra coal. If I did, I would go there. Um, what about grain? Because Bruce is definitely gonna need more grain if he wants to build something. Um, grain's not one I need for, well, I guess I, ha yeah, right. I have everything for the pumpkin market. I will need it for the greenhouse. All right, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go here and hope that I get bumped. And even if I don't, it's fine, because at some point I would have to retrieve all my workers anyway. So I can either retrieve both workers now, or I could retrieve, I could have gone to the Zeppelin and then retrieve both workers after that anyway. It's the same amount of retrieves, and I think this maximizes the chance that I might get bumped. Not that I did, so I will retrieve now. But that's fine. And what I'm going to do is, I think I need a piece of wood. I will grab a piece of wood, and then, uh, and then Zeppelin, and hope that I get bumped so I can just Zeppelin a second time and bump myself again or something, we will see. But I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Come on, bump me from the wood, bump me from the wood, because it would be perfect, because then I can go Zeppelin, Zeppelin. By the way, I'm pretty sure these Zeppelins are made out of some sort of heavy, kind of metallic substance. Um, it would have to be fairly pliable. Does anyone know a really heavy, dense metal that's kind of pliable to make the Zeppelin out of? I don't know. All right, so I have enough to build both buildings. I'm still hoping I will get bumped so I can Zeppelin back to back, um, which might happen. I don't know, but we'll go here. Done. Which of the two buildings do I want to build first? Not convinced it makes much of a difference. I'll tell you what, we'll take the greenhouse because I don't have a pumpkin to spend right now, so we'll do the greenhouse first. Notice that there is these sort of victory points listed on these buildings, but they have the crown. This, These are going to be points that accrue to the final campaign victory. The number here does not have any impact whatsoever on the victory points for this particular game. So I will build the greenhouse, spend the resources, put it somewhere. Um, you know what? I'll put it top left. That way both of my pumpkin producers will be on the left-hand side. Um, later on, you can overwrite your buildings. If you get like a better building that you want, you can put a sticker on top of an existing one. You can never cover up the basic production building because someone's always got to be able to get pumpkins without a cost, for example. But the others would probably will get replaced. These are fairly early, low-end buildings. Anyway, I'm going to confirm that move. I did get my seven victory points. I'm up to 12. I'm not currently winning. Although, remember, I do have an extra 10 coming for me from the reputation, although so does yellow. <sighs> no one bumped me from the woods. Damn, so I do have to do a retrieve all. There may have been a more efficient way to milk things there, but again, part of it is hindsight of like knowing where the people will play. I felt like I maximized the odds that I'd be in a position where someone might um, might bump me, but it was not the case. Ooh, this is very interesting. Um, right now, this little indicator here is pointing out that the next time the progress track gets increased, you will have the option of putting an extra token on the reputation track. So that's what it's showing there. And I probably will do that. So I'm going to play here on the Zeppelin a second time because I have the resources for it. I am going to go and build my pumpkin market. I think I'll keep everything close together for now. I'm going to go ahead and plop it there. You know, close to town so people don't have to walk so far for their shopping if they want to sell their markets. And I will go and put an extra token on here. So this will put me in two reputation tokens on here, which will put me back in first. I, doing this 
It won't change how many victory points it'll earn. I still only earn 10, but I'm not going to knock yellow down to second where he'll only earn seven. But more importantly, I think it mostly, it will secure the 10 points for me or be more likely to secure it. So I will do that. Oh, wait, I wasn't on there yet. Never mind. Sorry, I did a, I did a test game before this where I was playing as, um, I guess I was playing as red. So I was thinking I was already on there. Never mind. So that actually is a huge turn because it's right now that earned me 10 victory points. If someone passes me, it'll knock me down to seven, but it would still be a seven victory point boost. I also got seven victory points for the Zeppelin, five for itself, plus two for Enrico the Engineer. So not bad overall. Worth the worth noting, the 10 points I'm going to earn from the reputation is not currently represented here because I don't actually have the 10 points yet. It's just, if nothing changes, I will have 10 points. By the way, I got a little kitty over here on the map. There's a little dude fishing over here. There's a bunch of little things that you can spot if you, uh, if you pay attention on this board. It's totes adorbs. Also, your character down here will take various actions. Every now and again, you'll see a little cattail here. I don't remember what else happens for me. If you watch the other characters, too bad the green charter's not in. She's the most adorable, um, and every now and again, a bird lands on her hand. It's so cute. Um, but yeah, I'm going to lock in that turn. I think that was a very successful turn. I'm very pleased with that. I guess the AI goes really fast. You probably aren't going to get to see most of their little quirky idle animations, unfortunately, because they don't take too long. There finally is the coal market. We might still do things like that. I've got two crates to open up. Crates need four gold each to open. Oh, I have all my workers as well. Oh, because someone else popped the Zeppelin. Nice. Okay, so let's take a look at our hand. Oh, actually, first, let's take a look at the objectives. So, I mentioned that the Zeppelin, the Charterstone, and the Grandstand all give you five victory points when you go there. Charterstone opens crates. The Zeppelin builds building. The Grandstand... You can play here if you have if you have met the requirements for an objective. So at the start of the game, there are five total objectives, but only three are drawn. I think there's only three objectives always, except later you do get personal objectives. But anyway, later rules. Try not to spoil too many later rules for you guys. But again, so much stuff gets added to this game. If you're worried that the game looks too simple and not strategic enough, although hopefully you don't think that because I think there's already been a few very interesting decisions. You have no idea what this game is going to be like once the board develops and everyone's got six buildings and the buildings change and there's a bunch of new rules and new mechanics like minions, um, the advancement cards. So right now we have assistance and there we saw crates and buildings. Buildings are also advancement cards. Other advancement cards, items, friends, guests, um, something else that I can't remember right now. There's, there's so much different stuff that starts happening, but these objectives. So, for example, if I collected six coins, six or more coins, I would have qualified for the Amass Wealth objective. And what I would do is I would go to the grandstand and announce to everyone, I have, am announced, or, I have amassed wealth, which would give me five victory points. Advance the progress track as well. Um, you don't, it doesn't consume your, your gold, right? It, you just, if you meet this objective, you just proclaim it and that's it. You don't lose your money. It doesn't cost you anything. Well, you have to use an influence token to go here because what happens is when you grandstand you take one of your influence tokens you actually place it on the objective because you don't you can only complete each objective one time but then after you do that then you can go and spend your money i think that might be our plan i think what we're going to do is we're going to collect a bunch of coal we have we have two crates right yes okay here's my plan i'm going to play on the coal mine four times. I'm going to end up with four coal. I'm going to keep bouncing myself. Then I'm going to play on the coal market four times. I'm going to keep bouncing myself there as well. And then with my eight money, first I'm going to grandstand, claim the objective. Then I'm going to open both crates, assuming the game hasn't ended by that point. But if it has ended, well, hey, at least I still have the money. I can open the crates next game. That's fine. But I do want to make sure to grandstand this game if at all possible. So yeah, I'm going to go here. It is going to bump red, but you know, that's okay. All right, I think I think I like that. I think I think that's going to be really good. So yeah, the first game, there's not that much on the board, so your actions can be very straightforward like that. But later on, you know that meme of like, you know, it's like the lady looking confused and there's like all the calculus that's going on in front of her. It's it's very much like that. You get in a mode where you're like, "Hold on, I have to do some really deep math to plan out my next 6 turns and make sure I've got exactly all the resources I want." Each action you do is so simple. But to try to think like Okay, what do I need to do to do all the things I want to do before I run out of time? Oh, I did just notice I'm not going to be able to open two crates because I don't have enough influence. I only have three influence left. Cost two influence to open a crate. Cost one to bandstand, so that's going to be okay. I will bandstand once. I will open one crate. I will save four gold for the next game because game one, anything you have banked, you can carry over. Um... And then I'll be ready to open the second crate at the start of the next game, which seems fine to me. So yeah, I'm going to keep going with plan um, generate four coal. Done, done. And keep bouncing myself, which is really nice. 
Oh, more progress. Yeah, new building. So here we can pay grain to get a coal or a coin and a reputation. It's worth noting. That's kind of cool. All right. And you can see, yeah, so anyone can play in anyone's charter. It's fine. There's no bonuses. There's no penalties. Although later on, there will be some cool stuff. Okay, that's four coal. That's all the coal I need. Hopefully, what would be very convenient is if someone else played on the coal and bounced me off it. Or the coal market, either one. I mean, I'm not on the coal market yet, but in a second. Boo, boo, boo. All right, we're going to go here. We're going to go here. There we go. So I got two coin for one coal, which is much better than the treasury. Oh, someone's buying an advancement. Good for them. Bumping over here. So yeah, I'm going to have to take a, a null turn where I just retrieve all my workers. That's unfortunate, but not a real surprise. I mean, you know, no one needed any coal right now. Okay, tight game so far. Ooh, Red did pull ahead here, so Red's the only one that's going to earn 10 from the reputation. We're going to talk about some maybe some optimization there in a second. Uh, I'm going to go to the coal market a second time. So I now have four gold, which is enough to open a crate. Uh, that's that. Hey, someone's playing on the pumpkin patch there, earning victory points. Now, for reasons that I will explain when we get to the end of the game, ending with a multiple of 10 for your points is very optimal. They're, they're basically break points. You know, hitting 10 gives you a certain bonus. 20 gives you a bonus. 30 gives you a bonus. Being at 39 isn't any better than 30. Well, except may, may, may help you win the game. But if you can, if you go to 40, if you can just get that one extra and go from 39 to 40, you will be very pleased with that. Um, I'm going to keep converting all my coal into this. I suppose if I got bumped right now, then I might not bother getting 8th coin, since I can't open 2 crates this game anyway, because I don't have the influence. Although, yeah, the other thing I was going to consider is opening a crate now for the influence. Okay, I am going to do that. Ooh. No, yeah, I'm going to go here. Because here's... Ooh, shit, no. No. Okay. If I take an action right now that advances the progress, I will have the option of putting another marker on the reputation track. The problem is that is what... To, a marker on the reputation track comes from my influence. So I would have to take one of my three to do that. Well... Let's say I go to Grandstand right now. It costs me an influence to Grandstand because I put my influence on the objective that I can complete. Okay? Then I would take another influence and put it in the reputation track, but that would leave me with only one, which isn't enough to unbox this. Now, I don't have to. It's an option. If I Grandstand right now, it will just give me the option to add an extra token, and I could decline. I think what I will do is I will do that now because I want to prevent someone else from having the ability to take this and put an extra influence token on there because it might bring me lower in the chart. So I'm gonna take my worker. I'm gonna go ahead and grandstand right now. Done and done. I will say, hey, look at me, everyone. I have six gold. I can complete this. I will score this. So I get five points from the actual grandstanding. Um, I'm gonna skip this because I need to keep my two influence to open this box. But what's nice here is I'm guaranteed to end, well, okay, I'm not guaranteed, Currently, if the game would end right now with the seven points, I'm purple, right? The seven points I get here, I would end with 31 points, which means I would hit that 30-point threshold, which is going to be really nice. I might, might, probably not, but I might be able to. Maybe I can use my pumpkin uh, market over here. I might be able to hit 40, which would be a huge achievement on the first game. Would be a substantial achievement on the first game to do 40. Um, I have to retrieve all my workers. We've got a fair number of turns left still. Although, here's the thing. As soon as I do this, I will be going to zero influence, which means at the start of my turn, the progress track will automatically increase and therefore end the game sooner. I might want to stretch it out. I'm going to have to make a decision here as to how quickly I might want to end the game. I think if I were to end the game right now, I think I would win with 31 points. Okay, yellow and red are both in position to get 10 each, but that wouldn't be enough to surpass me. Now, I can't end the game right this turn, but how do I feel that the pacing is going to go? I don't know. Um, I think I am going to... What I'll probably do is go like... Okay, if I were to end now, it would be 31 points, but I'm going to get 5 points from this. So 36. 
Can I get four more points so that I can hit 40? Keeping in mind, of course, if Gray gets an extra reputation, I'll go from seven to, I can't remember if it's three or four, but in any case, it's going to drop me down a bit. Still, I guess there's no reason not to try to get a few extra victory points here, and we'll see how it goes. Unless I, unless I just play here, and then we put on the clock really aggressively, but I don't think that would benefit me. So I'm going to pumpkin here. There are ways to get influence back. Not currently, actually. Hold on a second. Back up the bus. If I went to the market and I recruited this treasurer, from then on, whenever I use the treasury, I would regain an influence. Hmm. So I could go here now. I don't really want to use the market. Which, or the treasury, which is here. So first I go to the market, I buy the treasure. And then next turn, I could come here. Well, okay, no. First turn, I would go here, turn into coal and one gold. And I would get the treasure. Next turn, I would have to get some sort of resource. Turn after that, go to the treasury, turn that resource into coin, and get an influence back. I'd be at three influence, which would let me put another one on the reputation track if I could somehow trigger that, uh, possibly by going grain here. I, I'm, I'm thinking that's starting to just be too much. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here. I might not be able to hit the 40-point threshold, but I might be able to squeeze out a few extra points and help to guarantee the win. I think I'm going to go pumpkin, pumpkin. Worst case scenario, I can carry it over to the next game. Ooh! Yeah, there we go. Okay, well, I still have my seven points. But I'm the only one with. And here's the thing. If one of these gets an extra point, then what's going to happen is I'm going to be in third place, which is pretty bad. Is there an objective for having, yeah, for having three reputation tokens? So I think people might be highly incentivized to try to go for it. And that really would be bad for me. You know what? I am going to do this. I'm going to spend my last two influence right now. I'll open crate, uh, sure, crate seven. I am going to get at least 30 points at the end. Well, okay, technically it's possible that I found myself in fourth place if people really spend like crazy over here. I could find myself in fourth place and get no points from the boat, but I can get one more victory point from selling a pumpkin. So I'm going to have the 30 point threshold regardless. May or may not win from it, but open the box. And in game one, we're going to carry all these over. Opening this many boxes and having this much stuff in my hand might be bad in most games um, because a lot, especially late in the game, because I'm not going to be able to carry over too much, but it's okay here. All right, we got a new rule. It's private objectives are going to unlock. So some buildings, like the Botanical Gardens, which I... Right here. Some of these buildings will allow you to acquire an objective that only you will be able to complete. Um, and which is kind of neat. So I would get, say, for example, Card Mogul or something, I could claim as a private objective, and then I'm the only one who has the ability to grandstand to complete this. It's not a big deal, but it's nice. We get an extra building and an extra persona. Whenever you gain an objective card, select it from the top three cards of the deck, put others back in any order. Well, that's very spiffy. All right. Um, so anyway, we're going to do that. So I'm at zero influence left. So at the start of my turn, it's going to advance this automatically. I'm hoping, yes, great timing. It's going to deny anyone's ability to get the reputation from this over here, which I was sort of hoping for. I'm not able to go and use it because I didn't have an influence token, but it meant no one else could grab it either, which I find very handy. Uh, I have to retrieve all my workers, so that's it for my turn. There's not a whole lot left to the game because um, two more of my turns will end it. Uh, or if anyone else does anything that generates uh, more progress, it'll end even sooner. Um, someone did that. Okay, we're still okay here. Um, I have a pumpkin. Let's, uh... Yeah, I'll go here. End turn. So only one progress left. Oh, and it is actually ending on Bruce's turn, I think. So when it hits zero, um, everyone does like to like finish their extra round. Um, so, okay. If it had hit zero on my turn... That would be it. That would be the end of the game. Well, I mean, I would take my turn and that would be it. If it were, if it hit zero, say, on Christelle's turn, then Christelle would take her turn, Sebastian would take his, I would take mine, and that would be that. Bruce had already taken, and we'd, it means that we all end up with the exact same number of turns over the course of the game. Um, well, let's see. 
I got bounced. So all I'm doing here really is making a decision as to what I would like to carry over for the next game. Let's take a look at my cards. Uh, I will need some pumpkins to build a botanical garden if I want to go there, or I could just make sure I have some more money so I could open this crate. Since I don't really care about rushing to build the botanical garden, I think I'd rather get some coins so that I can pop open crate number eight basically as my first move next game. So I've got a coal. I'm going to go and just sell this coal for extra money. And that's it. That's the end. We are going to see who is the winner. Uh, oh, I won! Really? Yeah, came in fourth, so apparently I got four points from this. But I had enough. I won that one. Okay, that is fantastic. And you can see, oh, Christelle was one short of that 30-point break. So why is those things important? Well, the rewards over here. See these stars? These are called glory. Um, and as we'll see on the next screen, they are very, very important for your long-term multi-game gameplay. Okay, these are persistent. So we all got three stars except for Christelle, who only got two. A lot of times in game one, in my experience, you'll see probably maybe two hit 30 and then two hit two, maybe only one hit 30. This is actually pretty good here. If I ended it a little sooner, Bruce may not have been able to get 30, but I don't know, I might not have won. I'm gonna take the victory, it's gonna be lovely. What does a victory mean? Well, I mean, obviously, I'm happy that I won this game, but not only that, it will give me more points towards winning the entirety of the campaign which is really lovely. But a nice and tight game here. And again, I wouldn't have cried if I hadn't won. I really wanted to make sure I got at least 30, though, for that extra glory star. And you can see, getting to 40 wasn't really viable in this first game, unless everyone else played really terribly. So, glory! All right. Let's take a look at this little crown button over here. This crown, basically, each player has a little box. And this box is what's going to contain everything that you carry over from game to game to game to game. In addition to that, there are some places on the box where you can fill in certain things to keep track of stuff. For example, you will be filling in your, your victories. Every time you win, you will fill out one of these cups and keep track of it. Because at the end of the campaign, each victory will be worth six to eight points for campaign scoring. Spoiler alert, there's going to be, at some point, a decision that someone makes. It's related to these guideposts. These guideposts are special goals that will be in place for each game. There was no guidepost really for game one. Game two, I will tell you, the guidepost for it is whoever ends the game with the most coins and resources. Like, total everything up, and whoever's got the most has achieved the guidepost and will get to make an extra special decision. You don't know what the decisions will be. It's like, uh, you know the lottery tickets that's like the scratch, the scratch off, that silvery gray stuff that you scratch off with a coin? Well, that's what it is. There's a card. It's covered in this gray stuff. It tells you what you need to do to be the winner, i.e. for game two, have the most coins and resources in total. Um, and that person will get to scratch things off and make some sort of decision at that point. Uh, and they may not even know what that decision will be. Sometimes the decisions can be something that benefits them. Sometimes it's not something that directly benefits them, but has an impact over the course of the full game, which is kind of nifty do. Um, so yeah, you do that. In addition, at the end of the game, all your glory, so those stars that we earned, I earned three. Someone, uh, I think Christelle only earned two. What is that noise? Did I just imagine it? Did I just hear like a sound from my computer? Like a subscription or follow sound? Oh, I bet you someone, yeah, okay. Sorry, that's, that's something I have to adjust in OBS here. Um, sorry, I'm still working on a relatively fresh install of my, my computer, so some things are still a little wacky. Anyway, um, these stars, I will be draw filling them this on this these glory boxes. Um, and this is something else that exists on the outside of the, the sort of box that I use as a personal container to keep track of all my stuff from game to game. Um, if you fill in all the stars in one of these boxes, you get a special thing that will trigger at the start of every single game from now on. For example, if I fill in all eight stars here for the coin, for every game from now on, at the start of the game, I just get a coin. Over here, I get one resource of my choice. Here, I just start the game with one victory point. Boop. This is Peril Tokens, which we don't haven't unlocked yet, so we don't know what it is. Um, over here, at the start of every game, hey, I just get to put something on the reputation track right away. Oh, awesome. This gives you a minion. We haven't unlocked Minion yet, yet, but Minions are basically extra workers, and they're awesome. There are six different Minions. One is unlocked, sort of unlocked and or associated with these Charter, although it doesn't really work that way. Uh, but there's cool. The Minions include, say, these Bakers, um, uh, Clay Golems, Robots, Ghosts, Butlers, and Cats! 
The pumpkin patch is the one that naturally unlocks cats because um, it is in a, in a crate that, honestly, I probably already have in my hand. Crate number eight might unlock my uh, my cats or something like that. Again, they're not my cats. Anyone can get them, but they're sort of associated with a particular um, uh, charter, just sort of loosely like that. Um, so you'd get to start with an extra minion every every game. This is capacity. Let me come right back to this. Uh, this lets you grab an advancement card. So the advancement card's over here. Start of the game. You just grab one of these for free automatically. And over here, unlocking this gives you the ability to play with two personas. So we briefly talked about personas. So if I look at myself, I have two personas in my in my box, basically. Next game, I'm going to get to choose one of these to play as. You get to choose one every game. Well, if you fill in all those boxes, you get to choose two personas every game to use, which can unlock some pretty sick combos later on. Also, for campaign scoring, um, every time you, you play a game with a persona, you fill in the checkbox with a, your Sharpie, uh, and then at the end of the campaign, you will get campaign points based on how many per personas you have used. Again, we don't know how many points they'll be worth because that's going to depend on, spoiler alert, it's one of those guidepost things. One of the guidepost things will actually let you choose, basically, how these uh, what these things will be worth at the end of the campaign, which is kind of crazy cool. Um, uh, where are we? Oh, yeah, over here. Um, and then the last thing is capacity. So if I fill in all these dots, at the start of each game, I will get to add one capacity. Capacity is this over here. So in game one, all your resources, so all the advancement cards in your hand, all your resources and all your coins, you get to carry over into game two. However, starting from game two and forward, at the end of each game, you don't get to keep everything. You get to keep one coin. You get to keep one resource. So like a single piece of wood or a single punk pin. Not one of each, just one total, period. You get to keep one advancement card. So right now, if I look at my hand, I have three advancement cards. I would have to choose one of these to keep and I would have to discard the others. Um, and uh, what was the last one for capacity? Uh, burp, 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 burp. No, no. For capacity, oh, uh, minions. So you would get to keep one of your minions. So you always have your two workers, but your minions, your, your cats, your butlers, or whatever, you would only get to keep one from game to game. If you fill in these dots, you get to keep more of that from game to game, which is kind of amazing. Interesting thing, starting from game two, anyone who does not win, okay? So anyone who did not win gets to fill in one of these capacity boxes for free. So it's a little bit of a, of a mechanic to stop one person from running away with the game. So let's say you don't win the first three or four games or something. You might be like, oh man, I'm too far behind. Except that you've accumulated tons of bonus capacity, which gives you a lot more flexibility for future games, which is kind of nifty. In addition to that, um, while we and we fill in, if I were to fill in all the boxes here for the capacity, at the start of each game, I would get to add one capacity to my my box. So um, if you fill this in, you know, really early on, you will be able to have tons of capacity by the time you get sort of into the middle of the campaign. Um, if you end up winning a, a bunch, it actually can be quite handy to get the capacity from this. Um, but in a four-player game, or I was playing a six-player game, right? All six charters, which means, assuming all of our players are equally skilled, that means I'm only going to win one in six games, which means that five in six games, I'm going to get to fill in a capacity box for free. So the value of this is less critical if you're playing in a big game where you're not going to win as often, but in a smaller game, it becomes more and more valuable. Personally, though, I really like this one where you get at the start of the game to grab one of these advancements for free, I find that really handy. So I think that's where I'm going to put my, my glory. It doesn't do anything yet. I have to fill this in completely. But hey, I've got three of the stars filled in now. That sounds pretty handy. And that will bring us to the end of the game. Here's instructions about capacity, just giving us a hint about the future. Uh, I can go to the next game right now, or I could just go back to, you know, the, the main menu or check the final scoring again. Yep, okay, that looks good. Yep, that's fine. Go to the main menu. That's okay. But whenever I want, I can go ahead and continue my local game or go campaign. So there you go. Quillshire over here. I could start game two. The online play is the same. You can play a single game or you can play from the start of a campaign. Uh, you can. It's got the full sort of play by email kind of thing. So if you want, you can give people 72 hours per turn or some damn thing like that. It's really good. Again, this first game, relatively simple. I gave hints, you know, about some of the things that happen and unlock later on. Um, it is a very, very strategic game, really wonderful. You will definitely be rewarded for thinking strategically and smartly about things. Um, but it starts off simple enough that it is a really good 
um, introduction to to this kind of game, to sort of a worker placement game, to someone who's never played it before. They should be pretty comfortable in game number one and hopefully learn things very organically as they go as well. Folks, uh, thanks for watching this. Um, I definitely, de definitely recommend the physical version of Charterstone as well as the digital version of Charterstone. And uh, I know I'm going to be playing this a whole bunch. So thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.